But we're in week number three of 2024. We're already almost all the way through January. It's hard to believe. We're in week number two of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're in week three of our series, Fresh Start. And that's what I love about the new year. There's nothing magical about January. But what it is, is it's a chance for you to say, okay, if the calendar is going to reset and start over, I'm going to reset and start over. I'm going to put the past behind me. 2023 is in the books. And this is going to be a better year. And I'm going to start this year with hope. Because church, we can do this if we do this together. That's why we do the 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're giving God the first part of our year saying, okay, God, my focus this year is going to be on you. Not all the stuff behind me, but what you have before me. And as we're in the first few weeks of this year, one of the things that kept coming to my mind was that phrase, fresh start, a do-over, a clean slate. I don't know about you, but my generation, we had etch-a-sketches, and when you didn't like what it did, you shook it, and it started over. Well, I'm asking this year, let's give this life a good old shake, let God turn some things around, and let's have a fresh start and a do-over, because I want to let go of the past. I, wanna, I don't want to live there. I want to live in the future, and I want to live in what God has for me. Amen? So that's why we've done this for 16 years as a church. If today's your first Sunday, we're in the middle of, again of 21 days in prayer and fasting. We come together every morning and every afternoon for those whatever your schedule allows. And we pray because we believe that prayers are more than just words of hope. They're prayers that change and move the heart of God. And that's what we're believing for as a church. So today I want to talk about what do you do when you feel like, why isn't God answering my prayers? Why don't we see more miracles in the church? Why don't we see more power? And so I want to tell you the story of a father who is desperate to see his son change. I want you, if you got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 17, verse 15. And I want us to dig into this story. The story of a desperate father to see his son set free. The father says, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how, should, how long should I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Well, there's so much in this story I could preach two or three weeks on just this one little passage. But Jesus cuts right to the heart of the issue. These are his own disciples. He's saying, I brought him to your disciples, and your disciples couldn't cure him. They couldn't set him free. So he cuts right to the heart of the matter, and he's saying they couldn't cure this young man. Even though these men were Jesus' disciples, they had two problems. And he calls them out on it. He says, you are a faithless, number one, generation, and a perverse generation, number two. So what's Jesus saying here? Well, let's dig into it. Jesus is telling us that it is absolutely possible for you and I to be his disciples, just like his disciples back then, for, to be people that love God, believe in God, but also possible to be faithless, perverse. That word perverse is where we get our word caught in sin, sinful lifestyle, perverse. And it deals with being caught in the clutches of sin. And if you and I aren't careful, we can be believers. We can be people who trust God. But if we get off our game, if we get distant from God, we can get caught up and swept up in the clutches of old habits and sin very easily all over again. And then he said, you're faithless. I Meaning you don't have faith. Basically you're, basically, you're an unbelieving believer. See, he says that we, have po- we ha- could have power, but we don't have power. You believe that God can give you power, you just don't have it. You're an unbelieving believer. Because you can come to church and you can go through the routine. He's saying, you're not connected to me. You're not connected to the Word of God. You can come to church and you can, you're not connected to the Holy Spirit. You're not connected in worship. Because let's be honest, I, there's been times where I've come to church, and this is not a judgment call. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. But how many of you know, if you were in the presence of Almighty God, I mean, like in the physical form in this room, there'd be a different reaction. But how many of you know His presence is here? And yet we come into church, we're kind of flippant, we're kind of of connected to God, we're believers, we believe in Him and all that kind of stuff, but we're just at church. This is just what we do on Sundays. And so we come in and we're still checking up on our emails, we're still kind of updating our phone buzz as we check it, all that kind of stuff. And see, and the thing is, I watch during worship sometimes and I'll see a glow on people's face and it's not the glory of the Lord, it's their phone shining from their emails or, or that screen shining up on their face. And so the thing is, We can come into the presence of God and not be connected to the presence of God. We can come and not be connected to to worship. Our our faith is basically on autopilot. 
And God is saying, you're going through the motions, but you're not connected to me. This is why the church in general does not impact the world that we live in is because we've got a form of godliness, but we don't have the power to go along with it. So basically, your faith isn't strong enough to handle what you're facing. See, I want my faith to be strong enough to handle whatever comes my way. But he's saying here that you're faithless. And then he says you're a perverse generation. And let's pause for a second and dig into that. What that means is you aren't connected enough to God, but you're too connected to the things of this world. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like what he's saying is that I'm kind of in the vicinity of God. I'm kind of like stretching for him, but I've got a death grip on the things of this life and the cares of this life and the cares of this world. And so what God is calling us to do, he's saying, you've got to get more connected to me and less connected to all of this. Because when you're connected to the things of the world, what's your focus and your mind going to be focused on? On the things of this world. And God wants to transform you by the renewing of your mind. We're not connected enough to God. So let's press in a little more. Even though we're God's children, and even though I love my family, I love my children, God is saying, you're too disconnected from me. So during this 21 days, what we're trying to do is let go of the things of the world a little bit, let go of some of our diet, some of the things that we love, some of our stuff that are distracting us, and we're endeavoring over the next 21 days to get totally connected to God and saying, God, I hear you. I I, I want to hear your voice. I want to know what you're saying to me. I want to know the path that you've got for me. So here's, if you're taking notes, faithlessness is being disconnected from God. Perverseness is being too connected to the world. I want to be less connected to the things of this world because how many of you know this world is not our home? We say that as Christians. We believe that this place is temporary, but heaven is eternal, but we live opposite, unbelieving believers. We're still so ingrained in our life here, our hobbies here, our cares here, our world here, and I want to enjoy this life, and I believe that God came to give you and I life abundant and a good life here on earth, but we can't be so connected to this life that we forget that this life could be over in a moment. So let's get back to our scripture. This father is pleading with Jesus saying, I want my son to be well. I want my son to be whole. I want him to be healed. But even your disciples couldn't set him free. And so Jesus rips the band-aid off, cuts right to the truth, and declares why his disciples couldn't do it. Verse 18. And Jesus, boom, rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we do that? And so Jesus answered him in verse 20 and said, so Jesus came, said to them, because of your unbelief. It was because of their unbelief that they couldn't do it. Guys, you're my disciples. You're believers. But you aren't believing me for the miraculous. You're not believing me for power. You're not believing for me to do something incredible. I mean, how often do we walk into church? It's nice. This is where we go. This is church. I'm going to come and I'm going to be blessed by the Lord. I'm going to get into the presence of God. And Oh, I love that song. Or do we come in here and we encounter the presence of God? My wife gave that, that, that devotion this last week in 21 days of prayer that I want to encounter God. I don't want to come in here and just tip my hat to God and, and, and give my respects to the good Lord and the big man upstairs. I want to come in and encounter him in a deep and a powerful way and that's what this 21 days is all about is realizing he's real he is the real deal and I want to encounter the real and the living God so I don't want to be unplugged from God and plugged into the world so much that I lose sight of that and then what Jesus said is so powerful in this next statement he gives them the answer he doesn't just give them a a response he gives them the answer he gives them the solution so as we head into week two of our fast If you're honest, and maybe you'd say, that's me, I'm too disconnected from God. I don't even know when he speaks to me anymore. When I read the word, I'm not feeling his presence like I used to feel, and I'm too connected to the cares and the worries. I mean, pastor, I'm sitting here in church right now, worried about this and worried about that and and frustrated over this and feel hopeless about that. Right here in the very presence of God. So we sure aren't going to be able to fight the demons of this world. Because I'm not in my word maybe like I should be. Or I'm not, I, when I come to church, I'm not connected like I should be. And maybe you started dabbling back in some things that God set you free from at one time. 
And you come in and you feel a little bit of shame. You're like, I went through freedom. I went through, I've been a Christian for 20-something years. And God delivered me from that. And I'm too ashamed to ask anybody to pray for me. This is a word for somebody in this room right now. You're too ashamed to ask someone to pray for you because you're getting involved back in something that God set you free from. And it's shameful to you that you have to admit that. And that's where we come into the presence of God boldly and we say, you know what? I don't want to be this way anymore. And so, God, I'm going to seek your presence, and I'm going to humble myself in your sight. I'm going to get in my connect group. I'm going to find my group of people that I'm close to. I'm going to come down here at the end of the service. I'm going to ask somebody to pray for me, and I'm going to swallow my pride. And I'm going to admit that I need to be more connected to God because I've gotten too connected to this, and I've gotten too connected to that habit again, and I've gotten too connected to this, and it's disillusioned my faith. It could happen to any of us, and we can get entangled in things. So Jesus gives them the answer. This is why. He said, verse 21, however, this kind, what you're facing, this big issue, does not go out except through prayer and fasting. So your problem is unbelief and perverse sins, and you're too engrossed in the things of this world. But the answer to all of that is prayer and fasting. That's kind of like the crowbar that pries the things of this world off of your heart. You're disconnected from God, and that's your unbelief that's a result of it. But when you pray and you fast, prayer is connecting with God. And fasting is disconnecting from the world. So, Pastor, what does that all mean for me? I mean, I'm hearing you. If you're here today and you feel like you're far from God, if you're disconnected, if you're struggling with your faith and the the ability to believe, And you realize that you've gotten too entrenched in the things of this world. And you realize that you used to be closer to God than you are today. Forgetting those things which are behind. That's a scripture in the Bible. And pressing on towards what God has and has called us heavenward to. So let go of the past. Let go of those things that are behind you. Have a funeral for your past. And let's live for our future. And live for today and what God is doing. Because you're struggling. And maybe again you slipped. But you're here today struggling, saying, God, I want to turn things around. And right there in his word, the answer is right in front of us. And he's saying, there's hope. Pray and fast. And maybe you haven't done the fast with us and you haven't prayed the first week. Well, there's no shame in that. Jump in and finish the last two weeks with us. And maybe you feel like, God can't use me, Pastor. You just don't know. You don't know my story. Don't you think that everybody that was used in a great and powerful way in the Bible felt the very same way? Everybody, nobody stood up and said, it's me. I'm the gift to humanity. God's not going to use someone with that mindset. You know what he's going to use? He's going to use the humble, the one that God's going to get the credit for it because everybody's going to look at you. Wow. I mean, do you know, this isn't in my notes, my, my Sunday school teacher. I was in ninth and 10th grade, and Mr. and Ms. Harton were my Sunday school teachers. And after I became a pastor, it was a few years ago, and I think they meant it as a compliment, so I'm going to take it that way. (laughs) And not the way it felt when they said it. How many of you know sometimes people say one thing and that's not what you hear? And they said, we're so proud of you. Because if we had to take a vote, you would have been voted the most likely to never get saved. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Do I get a trophy for that? (laughs) Am I going to get a badge? Because it's not a badge of honor. But what they were saying is, God turned you around. And if God can turn me around and God can turn you around, he can turn anybody around. And that's what fasting and prayer does. It's that spiritual crowbar that pries the things of this world that have gripped a hold of your heart and it entangles and it pulls it off so that you can breathe and think the things of God again. It's connecting back to God and disconnecting from the things of the world. That's what the 21 days is all about. And we don't fast and pray to get things from God. We're not trying to manipulate God. We're showing God that we have a heart of worship and a heart of gratitude. And God, I'm thankful for everything that you're doing in me. And listen, I'll be honest with you again. I love what God is doing in me during these 21 days of prayer and fasting. But I don't think I could do it for longer than 21 days. The prayer I could. The fasting, I don't think so. And I heard somebody to say the other day saying, oh, pastor, it's wonderful. I love this kind of food. Bless your heart. (laughs) If that is where you find joy, we need to find you a bigger joy. Amen? I'm I'm teasing. But God has called us to holiness. Do you know what the word holiness is? The word says be holy as he is holy. 
It means to come out from among, come out from among the world and be separate. To be holy and set apart for God's service and God's glory. You and I are called to separate ourselves from the things of the world. Not to stick out, not to, to put the world down, but to show them a way out of the dark world that we live in. Because this is a faithless and a perverse generation. And if it can attach itself back to the people of God to where we lose our power, then what hope does the world have? So we've got to break free from this world to lead the way for those that need Christ out of what they're in. Because I don't want to blend into the world. I don't want to have to tell people I'm a Christian for them to know that I'm a Christian. My professor in college used to say this. He said, witness at all times, use words when necessary. I want my life to be a living witness and a living testimony to the things of God. I don't have to give people the 411. I don't want to have to say, hey, well, you know I'm a Christian. I want them to know that I'm a Christian because of how I conduct and live my life. Because we're called to connect to God. And when we fast and when we pray, we're breaking free from the things of this world, from the cares of this world that grip our lives and squeeze the joy out of our hearts. Fasting says, purify my heart, O God. Search my heart. Soften it because it's gotten a little hard and a little jaded. And if there's anything in me that doesn't belong there, God, I'm giving you wide open to show me what it is. Search my heart. And here's what God has been showing me. There's some things in my life that I'm laying down that aren't sin. They're just distractions. Things that keep me busy and occupied doing things that aren't as important. And maybe there's some things in your life, it's not sinful, it's not bad or anything like that. And so God's not saying you got to lay it down because it's sinful. He's saying, listen, i got so many big plans for you. That I need you to lay some of this stuff down so that we can do what I've called you to do. Because when you feel like all hell is coming against you, and you're under the gun and you need answers and you need breakthroughs, that's where prayer and fasting comes in. I mean, most people can quote the Lord's Prayer, even in people that are in the world that don't believe in God, that can say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they can quote the whole thing. But see, we stop when the prayer is over. But do you realize that at the end of the prayer in Matthew, in that sixth chapter at the end of it, he, Jesus comes right back after the prayer and says, I'm teaching you how to pray, but when you fast, is what he says in verse 14. When you fast, and it's not like he's saying, you got to. He's saying, when you. He's just expecting you to. He's saying, if you really want to be the people of God that I've called you to be, here's how you pray. And when you fast, as in Christians need to fast. And like we said, we're not doing it to manipulate God, to get an answer from God. I'm fasting because I want to get closer to him. I want to know his heart more. I want him to cleanse me. And I'm not going to make my prayer list and then hold God hostage to it and say, you said you do this. I'm fasting for this. And God's saying, wait a minute. I want to do all those things for you, but are you not fasting and praying because you want to know me better? Or am I just your vending machine that you're inserting prayers and fasts into hoping that I'm going to fulfill your prayer list? Because there's a difference. Because I fast and pray, I'm going to make my petitions known to him. I'm going to pray my prayer list, believing and hoping and trusting God. But when my heart is in line with God, I believe it changes some of the things that I'm praying and fasting for. And that's what this is all about. And like we said last week, we're not doing it to manipulate God. Last summer, many of you know that I had some heart issues. And I had to go and get a a, a heart stent put in. And they put me on some medicines. And they started talking such ugly language to me like no more salt. And and, uh, and all those kind of things. And just hurt my feelings. (laughs) Said, we want to keep your cholesterol low. And we want to keep your blood pressure low. And I'm like, wow. But if changing my diet can affect my physical heart. What do you think changing my spiritual diet does for my spiritual heart? And see, we're changing our physical diet because it's changing our spiritual heart as well. And you know what this 21 days of prayer and fasting and doing? It is totally interrupting our life. It is totally interrupting our daily schedule. We're getting up early and we're coming to prayer. We're maybe coming to prayer in the afternoon. We're we're eating different. It's taking some, some, some adjustment for so many of us. But it's saying, God, I I feel like in some ways maybe I need to recalibrate. I need to get back on your path. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip my life upside down. I'm going to change my schedule and my habit so that I can get out of my routine to hear you better. 
So if you're fasting and you're praying and it hasn't turned your world around, if you haven't unplugged from television and social media and gossip, whatever it is, you name it, then my challenge to you today is, God, help me to disconnect from the things that aren't necessarily bad but are distracting me and keeping me connecting strongly with you. And I'm going to spend more time in your presence and I'm going to spend more time in your word. That's the church that changes things. But honestly, it's going to take more than you just showing up for an hour and five minutes on Sunday. That's going to church. We didn't start this church 16 years ago so people could have a place to go. We came and started this church so that people could be transformed so that they could go and be the church. Not go to church, but be the church. And when we become the church, the world changes. So if you aren't praying and you're not fasting and you're not getting into God's word more, you're just on an extreme diet. You're going to look a little different. You're going to lose some weight, and that's great, and you'll have some health benefits. But if you're not fasting and praying during this and getting into the word, just go ahead and eat because you're not going to get the spiritual benefits. But I want to seek God with my whole heart. And I know many of us in this room, we're hungry for food right now that we know we can't eat. Because I'll tell you how satanic the attacks of the enemy are. I got on social media just for a brief moment the other night, and they said that Downtown Donuts was having hot donuts Friday night from 8 to 9 p.m. I have never seen that in all of my life. And I thought, that was strategic. Oh, that was a low blow right there from the enemy. So you know where I'm going to be. Somebody said, no, they do it every Friday night. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. So in two weeks on Friday nights, 8 p.m., I'll see you there. I'm going to get me a hot downtown donut. I'm going to see if they taste better hot than they do cold because I love them cold too. But I don't know about you, but this life can really get you with the stress and the worry and the cares. So many things coming at us, you feel like it's hitting you from in every direction. And what this fast does is it gets us refocused on what really matters. Can I tell you what really matters? See, some of the stuff we get worried about, those are important. Family, your, your finances, your job, your career, all those things are important. But eternity and souls are what matter most. Because you know what? I can have a rough life here on earth, but I want to have an eternal life there in heaven. And so what this is doing is it's refocusing my life. And let's be honest, life gets so busy with school and marriage and Study and work and ball games and hobbies and bills, you name it. And what these 21 days are saying is saying, I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to get more into the presence of God. I'm going to get more into his word. And I'm asking him to speak to me. And it reminds me that even though I have a life here on earth, that there are some things about this life that aren't the only things that matter. That I've got people that I love That if God does not change their souls, they're going to split hell wide open, and I'm not okay with that. So they're going on my prayer list. When I walk through this world and I walk through this life, I don't want to be so consumed with what's going on in my world that I walk by someone who is contemplating suicide, or I walk by somebody that is down and depressed, or I walk through somebody that's struggling, and I am so entrenched in me that I can't see them. That's what this is all about. Because we can. We can get so blinded by ourselves that we forget about others and we forget about him. Because people are the only thing that can go to heaven. And I want to take as many people with me as I can take. So fasting and praying helps me to start thinking about souls, heaven and hell and eternal life. Because how do you make people hungry? You eat in front of them. I I want other people to want to know Jesus by what they see in you and me. Our church gets talked about all the time. I had somebody ask me the other day, is this true? And I'm like, well, why don't you come check it out for yourself? But here's the one thing I can tell you is we're hungry for God. We want to see people's lives changed. And we want to make a difference. And I pray that that's the church that goes out into this city. We're not perfect. We don't have life all figured out, but we want to be close to God. And as we pull away from the things of this world, I never want to pull away from the things of God. Because I challenge you, during this fast, pray together with your family. Because if your family's like mine, we can be caught up in everything, and we come home, we open the door, we throw our stuff on the, on the island, and one goes to their room, one goes to their room when the kids were younger, and we all kind of go our separate ways, and one's watching TV in the den, and one's watching TV in the bedroom, and we're kind of doing our things, one's playing video games, and we're there, but we're not there together. 
And maybe that sounds like your family too. And what I challenge you is just for a few moments, hit the pause button and say, hey, everybody, come in the den. I'm just going to take five minutes. I want to read to you a couple of scriptures, and then I want to pray over our family. What's some things that you want us to pray for our family about? What's some things that you want to see God do? And let's believe God for those things together. And then you huddle together, and then you and dismiss. But you come together as a family and regain your focus. Because you've heard me say this before. I've even preached an entire service on this, that we're three parts. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. We're a three-part being, just like God is. One part is our body. That's our flesh. My flesh feeds off of what it wants, my desires. My spirit, or my soul is my mind, will, and emotions. It feeds off of my emotions and my feels. It feeds off of others. It's that need to be needed, that need to be wanted. That's where, why so many people can become codependent because we need others to need us. And then there's my spirit, and that feeds off the things of God. And whichever one you feed the most is going to be the one that controls the other two. If you feed your body, your flesh, if you do only what feels good, feed your lust, feed your pride, feed your desires, you give into your flesh most, then your spirit and your soul are going to be dominated by your flesh. And that's where a lot of the world we live in today is, is, finds themselves. There's people that woke up this morning and said, I'm not going to go to church because I don't feel like it. My body's tired. I had a long weekend, and so we skip out because we let our body call the shots. If you feed your soul, if you give into your feelings... You give into your depression, you give into your emotions, you give into your anxiety. It's going to affect your body, you're going to feel tired, and you're going to feel weak. And can I tell you something? You can be 100% well and feel your way into sickness. You can feel your way through depression, anxiety, loss, whatever it is you're feeling right now. There are people in this room that you have allowed your, your spirit, your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions to make you physically sick. Because of anxiety and worry and depression and loss and care. And the devil has got a hold on you. So when you fast and you pray, you disconnect from your body. You disconnect from the worldly things. Because I'm not going to let what I feel dictate my soul. Or you can fast and pray and feed your spirit. And here's the cool part. When you fast and pray, it impacts two parts of the three. It impacts your body because you're disconnecting from the things of the world and, and, you, and you're connecting to God and you're denying your body some of the, the worldly things that it wants. And you're connecting to the Spirit of God because you're praying and you're fasting and you're seeking God. So you're connecting to God and it's impacting your spirit. You're disconnecting through the fast and it's affecting your body. And so what happens? Those two things start pursuing God. And then your soul, your mind, will, and emotions is kind of standing out here in the middle and it's going, wait, wait, wait. My body's following God. We're doing the fast. My spirit's following God. I'm reading the word and I'm getting closer. And so now you're, all your feels, your mind, your will, and your emotions are all standing there going, I'm here all alone. If they're going towards God, I'm going to go too. And I'm not going to let what I feel. I'm not going to let what happened then dictate what God is going to do right now. That's huge. And then when that happens, in the middle of the fast, you're going to get a faith boost like King David did. Psalm 103.1, he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. He got a glimpse of God. He got a hold of God. And all of a sudden, the dryness began to, to, to go away. The anxiety began to fall off. And the fears began to break. Because we give God our spirit, soul, and body. I give him all of me. So I want to close with this. Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 is known as the fasting chapter. The whole chapter is about what happens when you and I fast. And God tells us in this chapter that he gives us three promises. And if you've ever studied it, there's three of them. And they're called the then promises because God says this and then this, then this, then this. And the first one is Isaiah 58, verse 8. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. So healing is going to come to your life, to your marriage, to your family, to your body. Healing in Jesus' name. Then righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. You know what righteousness is? It says then your righteousness will go before you. When you're righteous, you are in right standing with God. 
Because you begin to align yourself with God and you begin to soften your heart to the things of God, you become righteous in right standing with Him. And you get your life in alignment with God again because you reconnect with Him. And then God says, no matter what you face, I will be your rear guard. I got you. I got you. I got your back. And then verse 9 closes and says, and then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and He will say, hear am I. He says, I hear you. I see you. I'm here. You're going to call to me, and I'm going to answer. But as your pastor, can I tell you that it may not always be the answer you wanted, but I can promise you he is a good God, and I can promise you it will always be the answer you need, because what you want versus what you need aren't always the same. And that's where we don't want to be unbelieving believers. Do we believe that God knows best? If we say that he does, then we make our petitions known to him. We pray. We seek his face. We give him our prayers, but then we trust him for the answer. That's what these 21 days are all about. So church, let's do this together. Let's seek him wholeheartedly. Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 7.15 a.m. And in the evening, 5.30 to 6.15 p.m., we come together Monday through Friday and we pray together. And then on Saturdays, 9 to 8, we, uh, 9 to 10, we come in and we pray together on Saturdays. Why? Because we need him desperately. And we need him to change our hearts and change our lives, change our situation. So I invite you to join us these last two weeks of this journey. And let's do this together. And then we're going to come together on the last day of the fast. I'll tell you that in two Sundays and we're going to come together we're going to worship and then we're going to go out of here and eat everything we didn't get to eat for the last 21 days and we're going to break the fast and we're going to celebrate Jesus amen so I want us to pray let's pray Father I ask you right now show us your glory let us see your heart and Father we thank you that we get the honor to do this to know you more So help us to find you in a deeper way. I'm going to ask you today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, but you want to, he'll forgive you of every sin you've ever committed. He'll give you a fresh start today, a clean slate. And you get to start fresh with a relationship with Jesus. And if that's what you want, then I want to challenge you to pray this prayer out loud with me. Everybody in the room is going to pray it, so you won't be the only one. So let's do it together. Dear Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Today I give you my life. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name.